Hello and welcome. My name is Austin Byrne. I'm a senior product manager for GE Grid Automation's monitoring and diagnostics business. Today we're going to take a look at integrated condition monitoring, merging data from relays and asset monitors for a fuller evaluation. Many organizations across the globe share a common business goal. Implement operational efficiencies whilst maintaining a reliable service for customers. What exactly does that statement mean? Essentially, it means reduce spend and risk exposure, which can be translated into do more with less. There's an abundance of aging assets across the globe increasing risk exposure, especially if poorly maintained. You can see in the two images on the slide, one on the left hand slide is a transformer that's been in operation for 40 plus years. Now this transformer is operating and doing what it's supposed to but at this point it is well beyond its designed uh, life. And that is a, a common theme in many utilities where they have assets still operating today and playing a crucial role in the grid, which are, are operating well beyond their design life. You can also see on the screen a typical bathtub curve for assets, which shows an increased risk of failure at the very early stages of the assets life. And then that reduces and stabilizes and then starts to increase again as the asset gets older and components start to wear. And this is why maintenance is very important, obviously, because you're you're taking care of any issues or wearing components before they cause an unplanned outage and a failure of the asset. Adversely, you then have a business businesses today are very heavily focused on reducing spend um, and that's the reduction in CapEx and OpEx where they're really trying to focus the money on assets that need attention rather than doing time-based maintenance, which might be less cost-effective because you're looking at spreading your budget across all of the assets instead of focusing on the assets that really need attention, which is referred to condition-based maintenance. And then you're looking at your CapEx spend as well, where you're trying to understand when an asset needs to be replaced and making sure that you replace the asset at its optimal time when it's at end of life, basically, and it can no longer uh, serve its uh, purpose in the grid. So how do we do this? How do we achieve this business goal? So data drives a lot of um, the information that is used to make these decisions and to achieve this goal. Data drives insights and information. Information drives decisions and decisions drive outcome. The data is derived from critical components and assets. But that data must be refined into, into information. The data alone is not, is not uh, sufficient. The refinement is done by the analysis and interpretation of the data. And the analysis and interpretation is done by experts and expert systems um, who help perform this evaluation. However, unfortunately, we hear a lot in the industry that the capability and time available to manually analyze this data is dwindling. Um, we hear from many utilities uh, that their transformer expertise is decreasing as um, colleagues and co-workers get to retirement age and slowly the expertise is being lost. Um, what we find is there's a bit of a gap between the newer engineers who come in to, to take up the posts and, and perform the duties of the, the person who's now at retirement age and there's there's quite a big knowledge gap there which needs to be filled so organizations and departments and subject matter experts are are looking for help at bridging this gap and understanding how to analyze the data more efficiently and how to derive the best information from the data and that leads on to the phrase work smarter not harder so you can see the image I have on screen here is of a cyclist in a, in a race. You can go onto YouTube and if you search for cyclist Superman, you can see this footage. It's, 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 uh, it's interesting to watch. Essentially, the cyclist adopts this pose so that he can strip, uh, streamline and strip stream the uh, components or sorry, the, the opponents in his race and he overtakes them without having to do any pedaling at all. So he's working smarter, not harder, and he's able to get ahead of his competition. When we look at the data analysis challenge, then there are two main areas of focus that I wanted to look at. Underutilization of data greatly hinders the achievement of business goals. Um, I think that's a very safe assumption to make. If you're not using the data wisely, 
you're not going to be able to achieve the goals you, you put in if you put in place. Data isolation is a lot more common than people realize in terms of online monitors um, not being connected to sufficient IT infrastructure. And what that means basically is the asset monitoring equipment, such as DGA equipment or bushing monitoring equipment, is connected to the monitor connected to the asset and it's taking readings, it's taking information from the asset, but it's being stored locally at the asset. It's not being sent back to anywhere. And sometimes what happens is organizations um, periodically will drive out to the asset and see if there's any warning lights on and see if they need to then take action so that the information is pretty much stuck on the asset and it's not being sent back to where it needs to be. You also have a situation sometimes where the assets are online and they are connected to an IT infrastructure, but the data is feeding back into a historian or another application that the asset manager or the subject matter expert does not have access to. So they're not able to tap into that data and start analyzing it because they don't have access to those systems. So what's very important in, in, in resolving this challenge is engagement between the ID department and the end user. So they need to develop an architecture that shows where the data is and where it needs to be and what zones and network substructures it must navigate to get where it needs to be as well. Um, everything is resolvable. Every uh, situation that I personally have been involved with has a solution. It's just about having the right people engaged and having the right technology deployed to achieve the architecture that you need. It's very important that the ID IT departments, the end users, and uh, as well the vendors who provide the, the online equipment get together and really understand the architecture of how to get the data from the substation up into the corporate level or where it needs to be. And sometimes it can have to navigate through multiple firewalls or multiple network substructures. And it's okay, it's achievable. It's just about making sure that you know what needs to be done and how to do it. Another major cause of data underutilization is understanding what data is available. Um, so there is a lack of awareness of the valuable data that's captured by equipment classified as non-monitoring. So an example of that would be a relay. So essentially a relay, which everyone I'm sure is, is very familiar with, is there to serve a specific purpose of, of tripping a, a transformer um, should there be a need to. But there's a lot of valuable data captured on the relay during its normal operation. Um, as well as when the events occurred that can be analyzed and can really give you an in insight into what is happening situationally with that asset um, based on events that might be occurring or parameters that are being measured. Um, often relays are managed by separate departments to the asset management. So a transformer um, asset manager might be a completely separate department and set of people than the folks that look after the relays, often the protection and control folks who are only interested in protecting the relay or protecting the transformer and making sure that the relay will operate when it needs to. So you have this mindset that as long as the relay trips and prevents damage to the connected asset, then it's done its job. So the valuable information that's captured by the relay sometimes is lost because it's not being analyzed and it's not being sent to the people who could really, really use it. So you have things like the events, transient records, fault reports, uh, breaker records, digital counters, energization records. So there's a wealth of information being captured by relays that could be analyzed um, by the transformer experts. It's estimated that 2.5 quadrillion bytes of data are generated each day. And that was a study done by Forbes. Now that's global data. So that's data being generated by everybody across the globe, not utilities or grids. But it's safe to assume that the data being generated by grids is increasing exponentially based on the amount of sensors that are being deployed and enhancements around those sensors and their capabilities. So as organizations start to work with vendors of online monitoring to understand what is required, 
the vendor then can change the sensor, use the sensing technology that exists today, but capture new data, new types of data that they were not able to do before, thus providing more and more information on the, the assets condition that's being monitored. So we look at ICM in particular and what ICM does that provides a solution. So ICM is basically about capturing, accurately analyzing and interpreting the data from multiple sources and asset types, which we just discussed. It provides a holistic picture of an asset's condition and its risk as well. So it's not just about the information and the data, it's about what does that mean to the operational risk of the utility. Situational information and the impact of operational fluctuations and external events also play a part. And we'll, we'll take a look at that whenever we look at the different types of data. But there's a lot of information, not just that's been recorded by sensors, not just what's been recorded by things such as relays, but the other information that's available. Um, that can be, or sorry, the other data that's available that can be pulled together to provide a, a critical information. And the assets analyzed together give a fleet overview of the operational risk exposure of an organization. So it's not about the one-to-one -one individual asset assessment. It's about looking at all of the assets together and what does that actually mean? What does it mean whenever you look at all of the assets in terms of the risk in a particular substation or a particular region or zone, whatever it may be, because you have all of that information about the individual assets, you can then pull it all together and cross correlate it to see what your risk exposure is for your organization. When we look at the types of data created, so there's, there's a lot of different types of data available. Um, this is just a subset of the data available, but I think it's important just to sort of give a, an understanding of, of what the data means, because I think sometimes there, there can be a slight misunderstanding of what that data is and why it's being generated. So if you look at symptomatic data, so it's a symptom of an issue rather than the result or cause of a problem. So symptomatic data could, for example, be dissolved gases. To dissolve gases, gases that are being generated in the insulating oil of a transformer, be it the main tank or the LTC selector diverter tanks, what is causing those gases to be generated? So there's something else that's creating those gases. It's not the gas itself being created that is the problem or, or the fault. It's the symptom of something else that's happening. Fault data is often data that is captured by a relay, for example, where there has been an event or a trip, um, and it can be the result or cause of a problem. So you're looking at that fault data that is being uh, captured by the equipment as well, and trying to use it as part of your full interpretation of the, the information. There's environmental data as well. So the external environment which, in which the asset is operating, over which you may have little to no control, so the weather, for example, um, so what was the environmental condition of that asset at the time? Um, that helps you understand whether the fluctuations in the symptomatic data, for example, are possibly due to a weather change. So if it's warmer or cooler, you may see the asset operating harder um, or warmer, which can then increase the amount of gases um, that are being generated. So understanding that environment as well can be can be important and then there's the operational data so the data measured and captured on the operations of the assets such as load energization tap changes thermal um, uh, cooling so uh, the coolings of the of the transformer is the cooling bank operating regularly is it operating when it should um, all of that operational data again is very very important to understanding what exactly is going on within the actual uh, transformer or, or asset uh, in particular being analyzed. So the ICM methodology really is about cross-correlating all of the multiple sets of data available to provide a better understanding of what's happening within the, inside the asset. So sensors and monitors and the analysis of the data that's available it's all about trying to figure out what's going on in the asset without having to do invasive, intrusive um, investigations. So taking the asset offline, stripping it down, 
and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, all of that's very expensive. So organizations adopt data analysis using sensors and equipment to try and reduce the need for doing that expensive uh, types of investigation. And ultimately it's about understanding is the asset at risk. Am I gonna have a problem here? Is this asset gonna fail because of the, the DGA, for example, um, that I'm seeing? So let's take a look at a real world application of ICM. So this particular study was done um, roughly about a year ago, and it was a, a, a transformer in a substation that was feeding a metropolitan city. So it was quite an old transformer, as you can see, it was 40 tier, 42 years old, um, but it was operating fine. Um, there were abnormal DGA results, and that's what um, prompted the utility to, to uh, do the investigation, was they were seeing these DGA results that, that were, not, were not great. Um, it was a critically loaded substation, obviously being in a metropolitan city, um, there was a lot of load required, so it was quite heavily um, loaded and obviously then uh, critical to the, the operation of the substation. And ultimately, the utility wanted to dis understand um, what they needed to do. So if and when it was necessary to take the transformer out of service, um, and how long they can safely continue that transformer in service specifically um, without it uh, unexpectedly failing. So let's take a look at the equipment and the data that was being generated. So there were a few online um, sensors uh, attached to the transformer. There was a nine gas and moisture online DGA, which was taking a sample every two hours. You had RTDs doing a continuous measurement of the top oil and the ambient temperature, which was being recorded every 15 minutes. You then had um, the electrical parameters being recorded by the relay, which again was measuring continuously um, and recording the, um, the findings every 15 minutes. So data correlation analysis was required to understand the impact of the electrical events on the transformers condition as well. So we were looking at the OLTC operations of the transformer and if that played any uh, significant role in the, um, the, the gas generation that was being seen. And then there was the trip events associated with the transformer line, again, captured by the, the relay and the behavior of the asset when operating on and offload. So we'll dive into the data analysis to, to take a look at what was discovered um, over the, the period of um, uh, monitoring. So cross correlation again was very important in understanding this data and um, analyzing the data, the DGA, the tapizations, the thermal information alone would not have given the insights that, that we're, we're, we're able to, to um, uh, discover. Um, it was about cross-correlating the information. So if you look firstly at the tap position, um, there appeared to be a significant effect in the buildup of gases based on which particular tap was selected at any point during the operation of the transformer. Um, there was a, an analysis done of the carbon dioxide and monoxide ratio, uh, which appeared to be relatively flat. There didn't seem to be any significant increase or decrease in the CO2 CO ratio. And we'll get to, to what that meant uh, when we look at the, um, the results of the analysis. Um, but as you can see here, there appears to be uh, significant gassing across specific taps uh, for your, your hot metal gases, particularly your acetylene and your hydrogen, and we'll, we'll take a look at, at what we discovered there. When we look at the variations in the LV side voltage in response to the tap position, you can see that the line faults are visible. So we can see here where we have the events um, specified by the um, the blue lines that you can see which which jot up on the left hand um, chart and then the variations in voltage um, across that. Then if we take a look at the top oil temperature um, it varied between 40 and 60 degrees and um, there was no significant increase or decrease that we would associate to any particular um, 
uh, point to any fault or any issue. Um, we've just seen a steady um, variation between 40 and 60 degrees. Then we look at the moisture. So we can see here that moisture followed a similar trend to the load of the transformer. So as load increased, moisture increased. As load decreased, moisture decreased. Um, so we can see that in this graph as well. So if you look particularly at acetylene and hydrogen generation, as I said in a, a few slides back, there was an indication that acetylene and hydrogen was being generated at specific tap positions. Um, the load current did not show any significant impact on organ intensity, um, as can be seen. But certainly the concentrations of these gases continued to increase in the absence of load when there was a tap position 13. So even with load variation and absence of load, we've seen, a ver we've seen an increase in the gases at tap position 13 compared to your lower tap positions, tap 16, for example. Um, we see that the gases are increasing in tap 13. So if we look at the results of the analysis, so as I said, this analysis took place um, over quite a, a period of time um, in conjunction with this particular utility. So arcing was present in the main tank. That was obvious to see. Um, the acetylene levels were above acceptable levels. So they were higher than would be expected for, a, for an asset. Um, and the generation of the hot metal gases did have a strong relationship with the LTC tap position, as we said, particularly tap 13. Arcing decreased at lower tap voltages. Um, arcing persisted in both load and no load conditions of the transformer. And the line faults had no noticeable impact on arcing or top oil temperature, indicating that there was no impact from the external events that were causing these line faults and trip events recorded by the relay. In terms of paper insulation, as I said earlier, there was no real uh, significant increase or decrease in the CO2 CO ratio, which would typically mean that the insulation is good. If you started to see um, quite a severe drop off in the CO2 CO ratio, that would tend to indicate that maybe there was a breakdown in insulation and a further investigation into the actual paper insulation of the asset would be required. Um, but from what we're seeing at the minute, it seems to be quite stable, which would indicate that the paper is, is in good shape. Um, as I said, the moisture content seemed to increase as load current increased. So you, you, you could see the trend as the load increased, moisture increased as well as load decreased, moisture decreased. Um, that was being measured by the online DGA. Uh, so that, that, was, that was apparent. And then the partial discharge. So on no load and on tap 16, partial discharge was still present, uh, so still there. But this generation, the significant generation of acetylene and hydrogen was more prevalent on tap 13. So based on the findings above, it was inferred that a possible source of arcing was the tapping selector switch of the LCT, specifically the two taps with higher voltages. The transformer is deemed to be less risky when operating on tap position 16. Um, so the utility, whilst they were able to maintain the voltage requirement that tap 16 could provide, they kept that asset in operation until they could get um, alter alternative arrangements in place and take the unit offline for the maintenance that it required. So you can see discovering that information, finding out that the tap the top 13 or the higher voltage taps were the problem would not have been possible without the cross correlation of this data and really doing a deep dive on the information that was available at the time. So in conclusion, um, there is a vast amount of data and information gathered on assets that are in the grid. And as I said at the start, this is just increasing exponentially as more sensors are being deployed and as people are discovering what data is available. Um, and as vendors are enhancing their technology to provide more information. By combining the data during analysis, a more complete picture of the asset situation past and present can be created. So you can really understand your asset and understand exactly how it's behaving and whether that's an indicator that something needs to be done. 
Misleading data or false flags can be more easily identified. So again, this is something we hear very, uh, very much in the in the industry, where false flags and false alarms is a big no-no for many utilities because it causes problems. Um, so they want to try and mitigate against false alarms where possible and try and prevent those false alarms. And um, by cross-correlating the data, you can validate the information. So if you start to see maybe a gas alarm, you can look at other information available and see what does that actually mean? Is there an actual event occurring? And how significant is the event? Advancements in software um, and equipment and sensors make it easier for organizations to adopt ICM. So software obviously is becoming much, much more intelligent in terms of data analysis and is able in some instances to be able to do this cross correlation of information and point you towards a problem. Um, so by utilizing these uh, tools, it's a lot easier for organizations to implement ICM because they don't have to rely on the manual interpretation of the data. Data science and algorithms can automatically detect correlations in data for further streamlining the analysis. So the algorithms can understand gas patterns and understand loading information and tell you if there is a problem and if, for example, the DGA that's being seen is related to any other uh, parameter anomalies that are being detected. Information about each asset can be combined to create a more complete comprehensive fleet overview. So as you said at the start of the presentation, it's not about just individual one-on-one -on -one asset assessment. It's about looking at the entire fleet and understanding your organizational's exposure to risk um, based on each individual asset's um, condition and the importance that they play in, in delivering your, your organization's um, uh, process. And then allowing organizations to understand their risk of exposure, as well as providing them with information to preempt, plan, and reduce downtime, which is very, very important. What actions do I need to take? What do I have to do here to reduce my risk exposure and make sure that I achieve my, my business goal? So ICM enables successful condition-based maintenance strategies and reduces risk exposure. And I hope that was evident based on the um, the example that we looked at um, and of course more information is available in the paper that was written that this presentation was based on. So thanks very much everybody for your attention and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.